what I did to my son. And your people are doing that on a thousand different planets right now. But you can help us stop them. I deserve death. And yet, I think I miss my wife. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Invincible Season 2, Episode 8 finale video. Great episode. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, a bunch of cliffhangers and teasers for what's going to happen during Season 3, too. So we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'll be doing videos for all the episodes. Hopefully, we'll get like 7, 10 seasons of Invincible. They can keep going as long as they want. Robert Kirkman has teased that they will go way beyond what they've been doing in the comics. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. One of the ways they've actually been extending the series is also adding a lot of stuff that was not in the comics. Like there was a big storyline this week with Chloe Bennett coming and playing a character along with Ella Purnell that were not in the original comics. Don't worry, we'll talk about their cameo too. I know a lot of people are like, wait a minute, Chloe Bennett showing up. What's going on here? Careful for spoilers, if you have not seen the episode yet, we'll start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, all the big teasers for like the really WTF stuff that'll happen in season three. Like this is just the beginning. Things in the Invincible storyline just continue to get crazier and crazier as we go along. Like we're just starting to get to the really good stuff. But starting with the episode title, I Thought You Were Stronger, a reference to Mark's words during his battle with Angstrom Levy, where he thinks he kills him after losing control briefly. I thought you were stronger. Being driven beyond the point of control where he just wails on him until his body turns to mush, even though it's kind of an empty statement, like he's mostly upset at himself for losing control this way, and he's so worried about doing it again that that's one of the reasons why he decides to quit college and go full-time superhero. Like, I need to learn to master my powers so I can master myself so I won't do this again. I won't lose it again like this. The actual opening scene is of Omni-Man fighting on board the Viltrumite prison, fighting through a bunch of guards easily as part of the Viltrumite's traditional rules for how they execute members of their race, trying to make them pass a certain level of strength before they can allow them an honorable execution. It's meant to be this big honor for them, like a very Star Trek Klingon kind of thing where their honor is such a huge part of their culture. General Craig also taunts him a lot during this episode. R.I.P. to those random guards as they play Fatboy Slim's weapon of choice. Very apropos considering the episode. Also a bit of the funny record drop moment when they transition to Josh Keaton's other cameo scene. There were a couple of Josh Keaton cameos in the episode. One of them a little bit bigger than the other. This first one is just meant to be a funny moment. He's playing the random jogger listening to the Fatboy Slim on his phone trying to lose weight and they give him the invincible title trope this week. You'll feel... Notice the Invincible title cracks again, this time the rest of the way revealing the full black and blue version of the title. This is another reference to him getting his black and blue suit from the comics, probably during season three, just based on the timing of when this is happening in the comics. Like, he repairs his old suit at the end of the episode, so at some point he will just have to decide that he needs a brand new suit. Sort of like him giving himself a fresh new start to acknowledge everything he's been through up to this point, like all of his personal growth. Most of you remember Josh Keaton is the voice of Spectacular Spider-Man. He just had a big cameo during Across the Spider-Verse where they canonized his Spider-Man to the MCU multiverse through the Spider-Force here. We know it's hard, but it's the truth, Miles. Later in the episode, in another reality, he also plays a version of Spider-Man that's meant to be copyright safe. Like, Marvel, please don't sue us. He's called Agent Spider. He's not actual Spider-Man, even though his costume looks very much like Spider-Man's costume. And he's fighting a parody of Dr. Octopus in that reality. We'll talk more about that specifically when we get to that part of the episode, because that's based on a comic book crossover that happened in the Invincible comics. But the difference was, is that it was actual Marvel Spider-Man in the 616 Marvel comic book universe when that happened in the comics. Blame the Marvel lawyers for it not being actual Spider-Man from the actual Marvel universe in this episode, though. Same thing with the Batman cameo scene in the other reality he travels to. Like, he travels to the DC universe and talks to a version of Batman making fun of him for having a lazy name. Like, I don't know, you dress up like a bat and you call yourself Batman. That seems like lazy naming there. But while Josh Keaton's jogger character is saying the Invincible title, he shows up at super speed back home to find Angstrom Levy holding his mother and Oliver hostage. This scene is right out of the comics. Like, his battle with Angstrom Levy in the episode, right out of the comics. It mostly goes down the way it does in the comics too, like all the cameos, the crossovers, all the different universes, especially the way the fight ends, all meant to be pretty comic book accurate. 
When he asks if the Mark Grayson of this dimension is a risk taker, it's a reminder that he knows about all the other invincibles across other universes who all turned evil. He is the only invincible in the only reality where he turned good. It's a teaser for the Invincible War, too, in the comics. They'll eventually do that in a future season. There are a couple cliffhangers with Angstrom Levy's character that also set this up at the end of the episode, too. He destroys his comms to the Cecil and the GDA so they can't listen to their conversation. It takes them longer to get there and help out. He also reveals that in half of other realities, his secret identity is public because Invincible is so careless and so thoughtless in other universes. It's one of the reasons why at the end of this episode, the main version of Mark says that he needs to get better, like he needs to become a better superhero, whereas the other versions never bother to do that. It's also a bit of a reference to how dire things would be for him if he got stuck in some of these other realities where people know who he is. Like, he wouldn't be able to hide out if he had to live there for a while. Which he kind of does, because later in the episode he says that time moves differently in other universes, so there's a bit of a time dilation effect, where he winds up having to spend way longer in other universes, even though only a little while passes in the main dimension. Sterling K. Brown did a great job with Angstrom Levy in this episode, just playing him completely unhinged, like he goes totally crazy through this entire fight, like progressively and progressively getting worse. He seems pissed Invincible didn't remember their fight at the beginning of the season, like how dare you not remember who I am? He reveals dozens of the best doctors from across different dimensions saved what they could of his body, but also enhanced it so he does have some super strength now in addition to his multiverse powers, which he already had but they couldn't completely restore his mind or his body to normal. So the whole idea is that the accident caused his mind to merge with a bunch of different duplicates in an incomplete kind of way, corrupting his own mind so that he can't tell whose memories are whose. Whereas originally he was a pacifist who wanted to save the multiverse, like he had really great intentions, but so many of the other versions of Angstrom Levy from these other realities had very, very bad memories of Invincible and hated his guts, so it's all kind of bleeding together in his mind, and that's why he hates him now in this moment here. Generally, the first part of their fight here is him just throwing him into a bunch of different realities, just playing on that trope, showing you a bunch of different places. The first one is a prehistoric reality where Earth is basically still in a prehistoric state, but the dinosaurs evolved to be super smart, super strong, and it sounds like humans on this Earth went extinct a long time ago, as opposed to the dinosaurs. Like, he's the first human they've seen that's been able to speak. And each time this continues to happen through the episode, it's Angstrom Levy who brings him back to the main reality, only to throw him into another reality. Like, he's playing with him, essentially, and it's part of his own downfall. Like, he causes his own downfall. It's a big villain trope in comic books, too. Had he just left Mark in that original dinosaur universe, he would have been totally fine. Like, just strand him there, never bring him back, he would have totally won. He also winds up pushing Mark over the edge so that he almost winds up killing him, even though Mark thinks that he killed him. Whereas this whole time, he had tried to find a non-violent resolution, like he actually tries to help Angstrom Levy, like, all right, let's talk this out, we don't need to fight here. So really, you kind of have to blame Angstrom Levy for everything that happened. And if you think about it, he's also responsible for the original accident that turned him into what you see here, that drove him insane. He's blaming Mark for all this stuff, but ultimately it's his own fault that all this happened. Also a classic villain trope. Angstrom Levy also reveals another big detail. In every other reality he's visited, he's never met another Oliver. Like there's no half Viltrumite, half Thraxon, because this is the only universe where Invincible turned good and Omni-Man turned good too. Basically the redemption of Omni-Man. So in all the other realities, Omni-Man never wound up leaving the Earth to go to Thraxa to create a half Thraxon. Then we get our big Josh Keaton Spider-Man cameo scene. In the alleyway of another universe is Josh Keaton playing a version of Agent Spider, like I said, copyright safe version of Spider-Man, even though he's very clearly meant to look like Spider-Man with the A on his chest and the webbing, fighting a parody of Dr. Octopus, who he calls Professor Octopus, also copyright safe, who makes some jokes about understanding alternate dimensions. Like he instantly recognizes that Mark is from an alternate dimension. Like, trust me, I've experienced with that. That's also meant to be a reference to Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse with his spectacular Spider-Man being a part of a big multiverse storyline. So this is basically Robert Kirkman's way around all the lawyers to do the Spider-Man crossover from the original Invincible comics. During this Angstrom Levy part of the storyline, when he's traveling across universes, he winds up traveling into the Marvel 616 comic book universe, where he has an adventure with the actual version of Spider-Man. 
Angstrom Levy brings him back to the main reality. They start talking about all the lies and suffering that he's caused. He's talking about the memories from the other Angstrom Levy's and universes that get mixed into his head, which we also see, like we get flashes of the memories of those other Angstrom Levy's later in the episode. He's getting those memories of the evil versions of Invincible confused with this good version of the character. When he starts flashing to the different memories, we see another reality where he had to watch Invincible kill his son. This is also from the comics, like Angstrom Levy, this version here that Invincible almost winds up killing, also has a son. He winds up coming back later in the story, so like this scene of this son, even though this one dies, is meant to be a teaser for that other son coming back. He's got the same powers as the main version of Angstrom Levy. Notice this Invincible has a cape, like Omni-Man, to denote how evil he is, like the main version of Invincible does not have a cape. There's another reality where he had to watch him kill his wife, another one where he was a cop and watched him kill all of his friends and co-workers. There's another post-apocalyptic Earth after Omni-Man Invincible took over that planet, another one where he kills all of Angstrom Levy's friends executioner style, one by one making him watch. Generally to show you how horrible things can go had Invincible sided with Omni-Man and had they not turned good, proving what a miracle they are in this universe that things went better. Also to help set up the Invincible War that will happen later on the series. That's probably not going to happen for a while, but it will be a big, a big thing. Imagine what would happen if Angstrom Levy were able to put all those evil Invincibles together and team them up against the main version of Invincible. When Angstrom Levy brings him back again and he whacks him with that crazy lava looking gun, that's actually the gun from the Invincible Fortnite event that they just did. Like they just put Invincible in Fortnite. So it's like Angstrom Levy threw him into the Fortnite universe here. When he tricks him into falling through another portal into another universe this time, he winds up putting him in a Walking Dead universe. It's meant to be a big Walking Dead Easter egg because Robert Kirkman also created the Walking Dead and Invincible. There was a teaser for this in an earlier episode where Angstrom Levy walks through this Walking Dead universe with all the walkers. When we go back to Angstrom Levy and Debbie and Oliver, he also reveals that in a lot of other realities, Debbie winds up turning evil when she's still alive in those universes. And her whole speech is to remind you why this one version, like in the entire multiverse, this one version of Invincible turned good against the Viltrumites and his father. Omni-Man also obviously turned good too. It's all because of her positive influence in raising him and her positive influence on Nolan. It's one of the reasons why at the end of the episode, Omni-Man is like, you know what? I think I miss my wife. For just a hot second, I was wondering if they were going to try and set up Oliver's powers manifesting during this moment of trauma. Like when he breaks her arm and things get really crazy, I thought they were going to have some sort of moment where Oliver's powers manifest. But the closest we got to that, like the biggest teaser we got for Oliver's powers is at the end at the GDF where Cecil says, no, not a scratch on the kid. He's totally fine. I think they just want to tease that his powers have started to manifest so that he heals super, super fast. They'll probably save his full powers developing for season three, but they develop way faster than they did for Mark. We see Invincible travel through a bunch of other universes. In this next one, he's talking it out with some random people he meets at a campfire. He explains the whole time dilation effect. This is also a reference to Omni-Man during season one when he went to the Flaxons universe, which was moving at a different rate of time. The whole idea is that because of their Viltrumite DNA, they'll live for almost forever. Like they'll just keep going on and on and on. So even though technically they get stuck in these other universes for a long, long time, they visibly don't look like they've aged that much because their lifespan is so long. It could be a couple of years and it would only seem like a couple moments. Really good example of this is that Mark probably won't start to look older for a long, a long time. You have to imagine Omni-Man is like thousands of years old and he's just started to show a little bit of gray. Then he goes to the original dimension that Omnipotence came from earlier this season. In the comics, he's meant to be a parody of the Galactus character from Marvel Universe, voiced by Ross Marcan, who also voices Red Skull and Ultron in the Marvel Universe. He's also from The Walking Dead. There are a lot of Walking Dead actors in general that play characters on Invincible. Most notably Steven Yoon, because he was Glenn. But the whole idea is this is meant to pay off the omnipotence scene from earlier this season where the guardians of the globe face him. They eventually push him back into the dimension that he came from. And the whole idea in the comics is that he just goes from dimension to dimension, consuming and reshaping them in his own image. So he's just gone to the last universe that omnipotence came from when he showed up in the main universe. Then he winds up traveling to the DC universe and seeing a version of Batman. Like the reason why they don't show him on screen is so they don't get sued by DC, but they want to say that he's in the actual DC universe, making fun of his name being Batman. Like you dress like a bat, but your name is Batman. That seems kind of lazy. 
When they introduce Batman, they also play a copyright safe version of the Batman theme you probably recognize, like very brief. You're a man who dresses like a bat and your name is, you know, I mean, like, don't you think that's kind of lazy? Most people just remember him from The Walking Dead, the Invincible comics. In fact, fun connection to the Walking Dead universe that they travel to during this. In Marvel Comics, Robert Kirkman also created the Marvel Zombies comic, which they just did for the What If series, and they're doing a Marvel Zombies separate TV series also based on that. Then they go to another Mad Max-inspired reality where everything is post-apocalyptic like it is in the Mad Max movies, and they start to tease him slowly losing it, getting more and more pissed off, just driving him slowly over the edge. Like, this is Angstrom Levy basically pushing him beyond the edge of reason. And this winds up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy for Angstrom Levy. Like, he keeps yelling at him how he's just as evil as all the other Invincibles, when in fact he was not until Angstrom Levy starts to drive him in that direction. He reveals his super strength and they start punching each other across dimensions. This is also a bit of a reference to the What If series where Ultron did that exact same thing with the Watcher, who is also voiced by Ross Marquand, who does the voice for both the version of Galactus during this series and for the Immortal character, probably more famously within this series. Literally, this is the exact same thing that they did during the What If series. They punch through a dimension that seems like it's ruled by advanced robots, RIP humanity, again. This is one where everyone seems like they're living as human-machine hybrid cyborgs, like a Star Trek Borg kind of universe. There are a couple random wasteland dimensions, which he also calls out for being random dimensions. Most of them where Earth winds up being destroyed. This reality with all the breathing tubes seems like a Dune movie reference, like all these people are using primitive still suit Fremen type of technology. Maybe it's a proto-Dune universe. You also notice one of them is wearing a Burger Mart t-shirt. Then the way their fight ends with him just wailing on Angstrom Levy till he turns to mush, doesn't die, he thinks he kills him but he's still alive, is also right out of the comics. The whole idea here is that he feels so messed up in the head at this point that it affects him going forward for a long time in the comics. It also winds up informing his decision at the end of the finale when he's going to go full-time superhero. He winds up saying the title of the episode, he thought that he was supposed to be stronger, then Cecil, the GDF, come to help Debbie and Oliver in the main dimension pick up the pieces, heal themselves, as the future versions of the Guardians of the Globe find Mark and help him get back to the main reality. This is also right out of the comics too, like the way this part of the episode goes down. They imply he starts to lose it just a little bit, like he starts talking to himself and they make a couple of jokes about him going crazy which later the older version of Adam, Eve, and Robot basically tell like, oh yeah, you don't like what you turn into in this reality. You end up surviving, but you turn into something really, really crazy. There's a quick interlude back to the Viltrumite prison in the main reality, Craig just continuing to have fun messing around with Omni-Man. When the guards reveal that they admired him since they were young, this is also a bit of a teaser for the future Omni-Man storyline in the real history of the Viltrumites, which he winds up learning from Thetis. We will be talking a lot more about the secret history of Omni-Man, like there's a lot of his own personal history that he himself does not know. It's also a bit of a funny reminder that all Viltrumites typically wear that mustache. For most of them, they look like this. He winds up passing Alan the alien in the hallway, who uses his psychic powers to start talking to him about his prison break plans, like, we'll talk later, prison break, it's gonna be a really big deal. This is also meant to be right out of the comics, Alan the alien in the prison and them trying to break out. Then when the future Guardians show up to help Mark get back to the main reality, they try to explain everything that happened without completely messing up the timeline, and it seems like what they're doing is they're using Terminator time travel rules here. So if it wasn't clear, this version of the Guardians of the Globe that come to save him are his version from the future of his universe. They explained that he had been missing for 20 years, stuck on this planet. Robot also implies that he went totally crazy, like, yeah, you survived, but something really bad winds up happening to you. Because Earth went for 20 years without Invincible, things went really bad, but they wound up with four different time travel devices, and it just took them 20 years to find the planet that Angstrom Levy had sent him to so they could rescue him, send him back to where he was supposed to be, where he left from in the past, and fix the timeline. This is a big change from the way time travel works in the Marvel Universe, where, like, you can't change your own past, you can only create branch timelines. I think they're going with Terminator time travel rules here just to make it simple, and it's the way it went down when Robert Kirkman originally wrote these comics. So this Mark is able to change the way that his future plays out because he goes back, he isn't missing for 20 years, and they had this whole teaser with his relationship with Adam Eve where the older version of Adam Eve confesses that she'd been in love with him this whole time but never told him in the past before he disappeared. 
they kind of start setting that up at the end of the episode, but he's so traumatized by the end of this episode that he's just not totally ready to jump into another relationship yet. So they're leaving a lot of that for season three. But if you didn't read the comics, then this version is his version just from his own future. One of the reasons why the roster is also a little bit different, like some of the characters are the same, just older versions, is because not all of them survive. Like they imply that a lot of really messed up stuff happened in Mark's absence over those 20 years. But also, even though all the Guardians of the Globe have special powers, not all of them have expanded lifespans. Probably one of the interesting things here, though, is that the Immortal is not there, too, and he is supposed to be immortal, implying that in that 20 years, someone was actually able to kill him. And even though there's so much messed up stuff that's happening, so many WTF moments in this part of the episode, they sort of end this future Guardians arc with a funny robot scene where he jokes with Adam Eve about not messing up the timeline. Notice when he takes his robot helmet off, it's an adult looking version of Rex that sounds like Rex because you remember, Robot basically cloned his body, he's just really young right now, so this body of his will eventually just mature and he'll start sounding just like Rex. He returns home, goes to the GDF, they start implying that Oliver's powers are developing, no scratches on him, Debbie's slowly healing her wounds. When she asks him if it's over, technically that's just for now. Like, he doesn't answer because in the comics, it is not over. Ding, ding, ding. There's still the Invincible War. He's not dead and he's going to be super pissed. Robot and Monster Girl finally talk out some of their problems in the past. Her future self was also on that Guardians team and showed that she would accepted some of his help eventually and continued being able to use her powers without having to fear Benjamin buttoning herself anymore. This is them just starting to pay that off, like at some point she will accept his help and they'll find a way for her to use her powers without having to worry about that. They pay off another huge comic book moment when the real version of Duplicate reveals that she's alive to Immortal and just managed to hide herself, the original version of herself, and has just been living through duplicates this whole time. When they're panning around the Immortal's cabin too, there are a bunch of artifacts from across his life. They've been kind of vague about his true origins, but he's meant to be sort of a parody of Vandal Savage inside the Immortal universe. Somebody who was born over 3,000 years ago in this universe, so he just lived throughout history using different personas in different eras. This is his original superhero suit. This is his Abe Lincoln hat because he lived for a time as Abe Lincoln becoming president of the United States. All the swords, the shields, coat of arms are from the medieval period in history when he lived in Camelot serving King Arthur as Lancelot, like the immortal is a version of Lancelot in this universe. The chalice here is meant to be exactly what you think it is. They're implying that he was Jesus in this universe because death, resurrection, like we just had Easter holiday recently. It would explain how he could have been crucified and then come back to life because he is immortal. That's basically what happens to him. Every time he's killed, he just comes back to life. Duplicate explains why she kept her secret from everyone. She's just grown tired of dying so many times, so at a certain point, she just hid her original self and lived through her duplicates. Then we get another special cameo scene. This is Chloe Bennett from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Most people remember. She's done a bunch of other stuff too, obviously. But this is Ella Purnell with her, who's also doing the Fallout TV show that's getting ready to debut on Amazon. They're not playing characters from the original comics. It's just meant to pay off the joke from season one with the resurrection of Ka Hor. Ella Purnell is playing the daughter of that original archaeologist that uncovered his tomb and accidentally woke him. Chloe Bennett is playing a random new superhero character with super strength, also not from the comics, like I said. The whole idea is originally they used this Ka Hor character for a joke in season one, so they kind of use him the same way during season two here in this moment, where Invincible accidentally winds up trapping him again, like basically saving the day without thinking about it because he hasn't figured out his powers. This time he kind of does something similar. They also pay off the joke about him not being able to actually escape the curse of the tomb because it's two women and he needs to inhabit the body of a man to actually break the curse. So if you're confused about what was going on with Ka Horror, like what was the deal in season one, why are they bringing him back now, it's just for like a one-off kind of joke. But while he's flying across the earth, sort of working through his trauma, notice that he starts flying so fast that he's warping the fabric of reality, showing you how powerful he's gotten, but he still has a long, a long way to go. Remember, the whole idea with Viltrumites is they can just continue to train their bodies up so they can get more powerful. Like, not all Viltrumites are the same power level. It'd be like a race of bodybuilders. Like, some of them are just stronger than others. They show him watching Amber at their school as he starts to make the decision to quit, go full-time superhero. Cecil has their house fixed again. Notice the neighbor's house is still destroyed. They have a joke about there being another gas leak. Like, oh, wow, I should get my house checked out, too. So many gas leaks all over this street. He and his mother talk everything through on the rooftop. A lot of soulful rooftop conversations on this series just in general. 
He reveals to her why he wants to go full-time superhero and quit school just because he needs to learn to master his powers, not only because of all the dangerous stuff that's coming for them like Conquest, the Viltrumites, he needs to get stronger for that. He also is more worried about losing control and that's the real reason why he wants to learn to master his abilities so that he can control himself. He visits Adam Eve at the Teen Teen's old base, paying off his conversation with the older version of Eve. He starts to talk to her about their relationship. They kind of tease it turning into a bigger thing in season three. But like I said, he's so messed up in the head right now. Like he's just not ready for this. So they just kind of tease them developing that during season three. She is meant to be the best girl of the series if we're talking about anime tropes. So like it's always going to be her. Of course, they have a post credit scene setting up season three. They tease the prison break with Alan the alien continuing his conversation with Omni-Man, sort of explaining what he's doing there and why he wants to save him, why he needs to help them and Thetis's plan. Omni-Man starts to explain how he's fundamentally changed the way he thinks about everyone, like he started to care about everyone. It's his continuing redemption. Like part of the series is the development of Invisible. It's called the Invincible series, but it's also about the redemption of Omni-Man. They basically end on the idea that he has decided that he will help them, but it sounds like it's mostly because he starts to miss his wife, Debbie. Like he says it out loud, I think I miss my wife, teasing their reunion during season three. So obviously he does care about stopping the Viltrumites and he does want to help Alan the Alien, Thetis, the Coalition of Planets. But it sounds like heavy on his mind is his original family, like Mark and Debbie. So at some point they will have that reunion too. There are a couple big cliffhangers that they leave on here just in general too. Like I said, Prison Break, they're probably going to pull that at the beginning of Season 3 just to have a big WTF moment at the beginning of the season. They'll return to the Coalition of Planets where Thetis can reveal more secrets about Omni-Man's history that he himself does not know because Thetis was around for all this stuff. Like he's much older than Omni-Man. If you don't remember, Thetis reveals that during the original Viltrumite Civil War, he killed their original king, then left the Viltrumites to create the Coalition of Planets in the first place. This is going to be a really big Omni-Man arc that's going on in the background in addition to everything that's happening to the Invincible character on his side of things. Anissa also teased the coming of Conquest. He's probably going to be the big threat during Season 3, like the other stronger Viltrumite who would make Earth suffer if Mark didn't get with the Viltrumite's plan to conquer the planet and step to it. You have everything that's going on with Angstrom Levy, the other Invincibles and other universes. You also have all the Viltrumites coming for Earth in the main universe, like that's still in the background too. So the scale of everything starts growing exponentially. We also have Oliver coming into his powers. Remember, he's aging super quick. And generally, Adam Eve and Invincibles relationship just turning into an actual thing during season three. One of the other big changes with the way they end the episode too is that there's no music over the end credits. Like it's just dead silence just to sort of end on a WTF moment like, yep, all that just happened is only going to get crazier. There were so many Easter eggs and references, teasers for season three during the finale. If there's anything that I didn't talk about in the video that you spotted in the episode, write it below in the comments and I'll add that in my future videos. And I'll start doing some more Invincible season three videos as I start releasing some more teasers. We should be getting season three episodes next year without a break. Part of the idea is they renewed season two and season three at the same time so that they could start production of that faster and get it out faster. So hopefully future seasons after this, like season four, season five, however long they wind up going, will be the same deal where we get one season per year at least. That's also why they held all the meta jokes in last week's episode, like the animators complaining about how hard it was to make animation and how long it took to make new episodes. There's a bunch of big stuff coming up. We're still in the middle of X-Men 97 episodes. I just posted my new one, so I had a link for that at the end of this and down in the description below. And we should be getting a new Deadpool and Wolverine trailer pretty soon too. Everybody click here for all my Invincible episodes and click here for all my X-Men episodes. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.